Welcome to the final week of Cellular Mechanisms of Brain Function. We've come a long way since we began this course when we discussed lipid membranes and protein ion channels until last week when we discussed the methods for studying the mouse brain during behavior. And as we think about behavior, it becomes apparent that we need to understand motor control. Behavior is nothing but muscle contractions, and the control of those muscular contractions is the movement that we call behavior. And so now we'll begin thinking about motor control, and as we think about motor control, it becomes apparent that sensory input to motor control is one of the major impacts. We govern our lives, our movements, our behaviors by thinking about the incoming sensory information. And so sensory input to motor control centers is a key way that determines behavior. Equally important is to think about the converse, that motor control affects sensory input to the brain. So, for example, if we think about how we look at the world around us, we make head and eye movements and we select regions of interest in the visual field that we'd like to pay attention to. And so as a first order approximation, we choose the visual information that flow, falls on the retina and that flows into the brain. Equally, if we think about our sense of touch, it's very obvious that the way that we move our hands and our fingertips determines the tactile sensory information that we obtain. So in order to get the information about the texture of an object, we need to stroke that object with our fingertips. And it's the movement of the finger that generates the flow of sensory information. So the sense of touch and vision are dominated to a large extent by self-generated movements that form the so-called basis of active sensing, where we select the type of sensory information we want to obtain by making specific goal-directed movements. And so we can think of the basis of behavior as a sensory motor loop, which neither has a beginning nor an end, but we can enter it at any point we want. We can think about neuronal computations that, of course, are influenced by sensory information that's being gathered, and that generates motor output behavior. And that motor output, of course, interacts with the real world. We might move our hands against an object or move our eyes, and then the visual field will change and give rise to different sensory input that then in turn influences the neuronal computation. And in that way, we have sensory motor loops that are the most important determinants of behavior. In this video, we'll consider the mouse whisker system, which is one of the key systems being analyzed at the moment for active sensing. Mice are nocturnal animals, they live in tunnels, and one way in which they can obtain spatial information about their immediate surroundings is by using their whiskers, which they actively move around to explore their environment. And the first thing I'd like to show you is a behavioral paradigm where we can see just how they use their whiskers to get spatial information. In the so-called gap-crossing task that was developed by Hudson and Masterton, a mouse is placed on an elevated platform, it's in the dark under infrared illumination, and what the mouse needs to do is to identify the location of a target platform, where it needs to jump over, and then when it does so, it receives a reward. The gap between these two platforms is so large that the only way that the mouse can identify the location of this target platform is by using its whiskers to reach across this gap. We're going to look at a movie where we film from above and we'll see the silhouette of the mouse with its whiskers. It stands on one platform and reaches across space to touch a target platform where it needs to jump to to obtain its reward. And so here you see the mouse touching the target platform and when it's built up sufficient confidence, it jumps and now it's enjoying its snack. Now that all happened rather quickly. So let's look at that slowed down 20 times and zoomed in on this area where the animal's whiskers are contacting the target platform. Now the individual movements of the whiskers become obvious and you'll see that most of the time the whiskers move at the same time, both left and right, and they move 
in concert with each other, but sometimes they become out of phase and they move individually. And if one begins to quantify the movements of individual whiskers, you can actually see that each whisker is individually under its own motor control. So clearly, if we're going to understand how the animal perceives its environment here and gets sensory information under these conditions, it becomes important to look at the mechanisms driving motor control. So how does the mouse control its whisker movements? There are two important sets of muscles that are involved in generating whisker movements. There are so-called intrinsic muscles, shown here in green, that are located entirely within the whisker pad. And attached to each whisker is its own individual intrinsic muscle. It attaches at the base of one follicle and at the whisker behind it at the top. When this muscle contracts, the whisker pivots around its insertion point here in the skin and is, put, and is rotated anteriorly in a protraction movement. So the whisker moves forwards through the contraction of this intrinsic muscle and it's pivoting around its insertion point. So the intrinsic muscle here drives whisker protraction as the animal reaches out in front of it to touch an object. The other important group of muscles are the so-called extrinsic muscles that are anchored onto bone outside the whisker pad. And when they contract, they pull the whiskers backwards. So these extrinsic muscles here are relatively superficial in the whisker pad. When they contract, they pull the whiskers backwards, causing whisker retraction. So we have intrinsic muscle that generates protraction, and we have extrinsic muscle that generates retraction of the whisker. These muscles are under neuronal control. So each muscle is innervated by an axon from a so-called motor neuron, and these motor neurons release neurotransmitter onto the muscle. And so the junction between neurons and muscle is a synapse, a chemical synapse very similar to the synapses we've been thinking about within the central nervous system. At the neuromuscular junction, the neurotransmitter that's being released is called acetylcholine. And the acetylcholine is released from synaptic vesicles, just like in the nervous system, and it acts upon postsynaptic ligand-gated ion channels, so-called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So the acetylcholine is released from the motor neuron axon. It activates the ligand-gated ion channel, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. That causes an influx of cations, sodium, importantly, causes a postsynaptic depolarization, and muscle is also excitable. And so, in fact, the muscle gets depolarized and fires an action potential, just like a neuron would. That action potential in the muscle causes a rise in cytosolic calcium concentration, and that rise in calcium is what then drives the biochemical reactions that cause muscular contraction. So action potentials here in the motor neurons drive muscle contraction and can then move the whiskers forwards or backwards. And of course the same is true across all the muscles in our body. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction. So now in order to understand how these whiskers are moved, we then clearly need to know where the neurons are that innervate these muscles. In order to localize where the so-called motor neurons are, the ones that directly innervate muscle, we can use viral tools, highly genetically engineered viruses like the rabies virus here that's been modified uh, through genetic engineering by Ian Wickersham and Ed Calloway. If we inject a red variant of rabies virus, so expressing the so-called M. cherry fluorescent protein into the extrinsic muscle that then gets taken up by the axonal junctions, retrogradely transported along the axon, and then it labels the locations of the neurons that project here, where the motor neurons are. We can also inject rabies virus into the intrinsic muscle and label then the motor neurons that innervate the intrinsic muscle. And we can have two different variants. We can have a red one for the extrinsic, a green one, green fluorescent protein injected into the intrinsic muscle. And so these are the pictures here of the whisker pad, the injection of the virus here into the whisker pad, labeling the axons here of the motor neurons, and here into the extrinsic muscle, 
labeling again the motor neurons. If we now cut sections here of the brainstem, we can then see the location of where the motor neurons are. And so here's one of these coronal sections here taken through the brain stem and here ipsilateral to the same side where the muscles are we see the locations of the cell bodies of the motor neurons. So these are now cholinergic neurons so they release acetylcholine here onto the muscle and this is the cell body and also of course they have dendrites all around here that are more difficult to see. You can also see that the location of the motor neurons for the extrinsic muscle are in a slightly different location to the motor neurons for the intrinsic muscle. And this is an individual example, and this is a group representation of where, in general, we find the extrinsic and the intrinsic groups of motor neurons. And so here you can see one of the general principles of organization of motor neurons. And that is that the motor neurons that innervate a given muscle type are located close to each other in a cluster. And so these motor neuron pools then innervate different muscles, and that's typical throughout the spinal cord and brainstem, that the cholinergic motor neurons that innervate a given muscle are located close to each other in a tightly segregated region. And here the two different muscles that cause retraction or protraction of the whisker are located in different areas of the brainstem, in the facial nucleus, where all the motor neurons are that govern facial movements. Now, in order to understand what controls action potential firing in these motor neurons, we then need to look and see where do they receive their synaptic inputs. So, like all other neurons, they have dendrites and they receive glutamatergic and GABAergic and glycinergic input distributed across their somatodendritic arborization. And the reason that these guys fire action potentials is because of the synaptic input that they receive. And so we need to know what are the presynaptic neurons to these motor neurons. And the presynaptic neurons to motor neurons are called premotor neurons. These are the ones that give synaptic input onto motor neurons. And we can use a trick with the rabies virus to label the presynaptic neurons of the motor neurons. So, as before, we inject the rabies virus to infect the motor neurons, and then we complement them with a missing factor that allows them to jump just one synapse back. And then that then labels the neurons that send synaptic input onto the motor neurons. And it turns out that premotor neurons are widely distributed across the brain in many different brain regions. And that's true for the whisker system, but it's true for all of our muscles. There are many presynaptic neurons to any given motor neuron. One of the hotspots for the location of premotor neurons is sitting here immediately behind the facial nucleus where the motor neurons are located. And here we see a couple of sections in coronal uh, sections immediately posterior to the facial nucleus. And you'll see that the red dots here correspond to the locations of cell bodies of premotor neurons that innervate the extrinsic muscle. So these generate retraction movements. And here we've injected the rabies virus into the intrinsic muscle. And these are then the premotor neurons that drive protraction, contraction of the intrinsic muscles and forward movement of the whiskers. And you'll see that there's an obvious difference in the layout of the neurons innervating the retraction and the protraction whisker muscles. The retraction premotor neurons are located here in the spinal trigeminal nucleus, whereas the neurons that innervate the motor neurons that give rise to protraction movements are sitting here in the reticular formation of the brainstem. And so there are two separate locations for where premotor neurons are located. So one would expect then that if we stimulated these neurons, that would drive action potential firing in the facial nucleus motor neurons that innervate the extrinsic muscle and cause retraction of the whisker. And so if we now put a stimulation electrode here into the spinal trigeminal nucleus and we drive current through that, it turns out indeed it does cause a retraction of the whisker. This is now a horizontal section through the brain somewhere around here where we see the horizontal section through the reticular formation and spinal trigeminal here more laterally. We would expect that stimulating this area here might cause whisker protraction. There are many cells here, 
premotor neurons that innervate the intrinsic motor neurons that drive protraction of the whisker. And indeed, if we put a stimulation electrode here in the reticular formation and stimulate it electrically, we see that the whisker indeed moves forwards, compatible with our premotor mapping. Now, there are many sensory motor loops at the level of the brainstem. And so sensory information, and both from the whisker system and from many other types of sensory inputs, impinge upon these premotor neurons. And in general, there's a great deal of local circuitry in the brainstem and the spinal cord that gives rise to reflex movements and even more complex sensory motor interactions. However, if we're interested in volitional movement, then typically this is something that results from cortical activity. And so if we're thinking about volitional control of whisker movements, we might be interested in the cortical inputs to these premotor neurons. In general, cortical neurons don't connect strongly to motor neurons, and most of the impact of the neocortex upon movement is indirectly through complex brainstem and spinal cord circuits through interacting with the premotor neurons. And so here we then introduce a anterior grade label for the axons into the whisker sensory cortex and into the whisker motor cortex, two areas that we think are intimately involved in processing and generating whisker movements. If we inject this virus into the sensory cortex, we can see the axons down here in the brainstem. If we cut a coronal section, then we can look and see that the axons are coming in here from sensory cortex and largely innovating this spinal trigeminal interpolaris region, exactly where the extrinsic premotor neurons are located. So you might imagine then that if we stimulate sensory cortex, that would release glutamate in this area, stimulate these neurons here, and that should then cause a retraction of the whiskers. If we now put the virus to label the axons into the motor cortex, and we then cut sections here in the brainstem, and we look and see in these sections where the axon's terminating, we see that there's a great deal of axon that's terminating here in the reticular formation. And that's where there's a high density of neurons that are involved in protracting whiskers. And so you might imagine that stimulating this area of motor cortex might then cause the whisker to move forwards. So we can test this hypothesis by putting channel rhodopsin in these two different brain areas. Here we've injected a virus to express channel rhodopsin in the sensory cortex. Here we've injected channel rhodopsin into the motor cortex. And this is now the fixed brains that have been removed from the animal after perfusion. While the animal was alive, we put blue light onto this part of the cortex and saw that that indeed generated a whisker retraction. So stimulation of sensory cortex causes the whisker to move backwards, where stimulation of motor cortex causes the whisker to move forwards, but it does so in a more complex way. It's a rhythmic forwards and backwards movement, very much like what we saw during the movie when the animal was performing the gap crossing task. It's this exploratory rhythmic palpation of its surroundings. And so as a summary, when we think about whisker motor control by the cortex, we can see that the sensory cortex sends axons down to the brainstem, innervates spinal trigeminal interpolaris nucleus that has premotor neurons that innervate facial nucleus motor neurons, and those facial nucleus motor neurons are the ones that are involved in retracting the whisker. And so activity in the sensory cortex causes the whisker to move backwards, and that could be viewed as a negative feedback signal. And perhaps that's useful if we think about, say, our cells that are exploring a dark room, we're moving our arms around, and when we contact a wall, the first thing we might want to do is to stop moving our hand forwards. We can't bring that hand through the wall, and so we need a negative feedback signal that prevents or stops that movement. And so that might be one of the purposes of the sensory signals and sensory cortex, is to cause a feedback signal driving whisker retraction. On the other hand, the whisker motor cortex does the opposite. It tries to get more sensory information. It moves the whiskers forwards to try and get more sensory information to flow in. And the way it does that is by its axons that project down to the reticular formation. Here there are complex neuronal circuits that probably act as central pattern generators that then innovate the rhythmic whisker protraction neurons that uh, uh, are the motor neurons for the intrinsic muscle that then drive the whisker to move forwards and backwards. So frontal cortex 
is involved in trying to get more sensory information, and the sensory cortex seems to be involved in a negative feedback signal. And so there are two distinct types of cortical control signals for whisker movements. So I haven't seen what the cortex can do when we artificially stimulate it. It's also interesting to see what types of signals occur from the periphery and whether we can follow through sensory motor loops. And in particular here, what we do is we deliver a stimulus onto one particular whisker, the C2 whisker. We have a piece of metal attached to this and there's a magnetic coil underneath. We can generate a brief one millisecond pulse onto this whisker that then activates the signaling pathway. First glutamatergic synapse in the brainstem, second glutamatergic synapse in the thalamus, and then the information is processed here in the primary somatosensory cortex. And after we deliver a whisker stimulation, some tens of milliseconds later, we can see the activity here in S1. It spreads within S1, and it also sends a signal here to the motor cortex. And we believe that there's a direct monosynaptic projection from somatosensory cortex to motor cortex. What you see here is that we are also filming the behavior of the animal while we measure the activity in the brain here with the voltage sensor dye imaging technique that we've described before. The animal is sitting still at the beginning of the trial when we deliver the stimulus, but by the time we've seen this activity in sensory and motor cortex, afterwards the animal in this trial is moving its whisker. And what we think is happening is that the animal sitting here waiting, waiting, and suddenly there's this unexpected sensory input that arrives on the whisker, and the animal might wonder, what was it in my environment that touched my whisker? And so it starts moving its whisker around actively, trying to explore, looking for the stimulus that arrived on its whisker. And of course there is none, because it's an artificial magnetic stimulus that we deliver. And it seems that the underlying neuronal activity, at least at the level of the cortex, is a large response in sensory cortex that might drive a small whisker retraction, followed by activation of motor cortex that might then drive forwards and backwards movements as the animal actively explores its environment, looking for what stimulated it. Now it turns out that there's considerable trial-to-trial -trial variability, especially in the neocortex. So even though one gives the same sensory stimulus time after time again, each time there's a slightly different response in the neocortex, and probably that relates to context-dependent processing of sensory information. And so here's another trial where we stimulate the animal sitting still at the beginning of the stimulus, but in this case, the animal doesn't make any exploratory self-generated movements afterwards. It simply ignores the stimulus and sits still. And if we now look and see what happened in the brain on this trial, you'll see that there's actually a relatively small response. There's a little bit that happens here in sensory cortex and nothing in the motor cortex. These are just two individual trials, but we can select for all trials where the animal wait, makes a sensory evoked whisker movement, and we can select for all trials where the animal makes no movement, and we can see in general how the pattern of neuronal activity occurs. And you'll see that on the trials where the animal begins to move its whiskers and explore its environment, that's accompanied by large activation in sensory cortex and also substantial activation here in the motor cortex. Whereas on trials where the animal doesn't make any movements, it just simply ignores the stimulus, you'll see that there's a sensory response in primary somatosensory cortex, it's smaller in amplitude, and there's nothing activating the motor cortex. And so, at least at the level of correlations, we can see that there's sensory motor activity when the animal begins to actively explore its environment, driven by a sensory stimulus, and there's other trials where the animal ignores that stimulus and that's accompanied by very little activity in the neocortex. We can also go and see what happens from the other perspective, see what happens as the animal moves its whisker and contacts an object. And so here we're tracking whisker position and looking at membrane potential below in black, and at some stage there's going to be a drop of this pole, it drops down, and then the animal's whisker is now contacting that object, and as it contacts the object there are obvious membrane potential fluctuations that correlate with sensory responses as the animal touches repeatedly this pole that's been put in its way. And if the animal needs to localize where this pole is, clearly it needs to take into account the motor position of where the whisker is, as well as the timing of that contact in order to extract the position of where that pole is. Here's another example of a different cell recorded where 
each time the whisker is touching an object, it's shaded in gray, and you'll see every gray shaded area here correlates with a membrane potential depolarization in the cell that's being recorded. And here, there's some action potentials that are being fired in response to this particular contact here. And so we can see that there's active encoding of each individual touch response in the primary somatosensory cortex of the mouse. And so there's a clear signal in the brain that corresponds to each active touch as the animal contacts its environment. Now we need to be able to put those sensory and motor signals together in order, for example, to extract the position of the object. And so it's interesting to note that there's a substantial motor input to sensory cortex, as well as, of course, sensory cortex that sends input to motor cortex, so they're bidirectionally coupled. Here we just look at one aspect, that the motor control signals arrive in sensory cortex. This is the axonal innervation of primary somatosensory cortex, and it seems to come in two layers. There's an upper layer of innervation here that arrives at the surface of the brain in layer one, and there's also deeper innervation. If we now focus our attention here on the superficial innervation of layer one, that's particularly interesting because it contacts the distal dendrites of the excitatory neurons in this region, and it's actively controlled by the GABAergic inhibitory neuron, the somatostatin Martinotti cells that send the axons here into the upper layer of the neocortex. And so the input for motor cortex in terms of its impact upon the dendritic integration here on the excitatory neurons is regulated by how much GABA is being released by the somatostatin cells. And when the animal is sitting still and not moving its whiskers, these somatostatin cells are firing quite actively. And so they're inhibiting these distal dendrites and it may be that the motor input makes relatively little impact upon the excitatory cells. However, when the animal begins to move its whiskers, the somatostatin cells hyperpolarize, they stop firing action potentials, and now the GABAergic inhibition that was strong before is now taken out, and the motor input can now make a substantial input onto the excitatory cells. And so there's an interesting regulation of this distal dendritic input by the somatostatin cells, and that then might allow for motor interactions onto the excitatory neurons, and that then might help the animal interpret the sensory information coming in during active touch, for example, by combining motor signals with the upcoming sensory input that also arrives, of course, in sensory cortex. So in this video, we've seen that if we're interested in understanding behavior, we absolutely need to investigate motor control. Motor control and movements are at the very basis of any behavior, and so that's an important starting point. We've seen that sensory input to the motor control systems is extremely important and forms the first way in which our motor output is regulated. We have various sensory motor feedbacks that drive reflexes, for example, and at higher levels, we can imagine that sensory input often initiates our movements and certainly helps us guide us through any action that we wish to perform. From the other point of view, our movements and motor control make a big difference to the type of sensory information that we obtain. So we actively touch objects, we make eye movements to select things that we want to analyze in higher resolution. And so active processing of sensory information is extremely important, both in terms of the information that we obtain and also in terms of selecting for specific types of sensory information. So in this video, we've largely looked at what are probably hardwired, genetically programmed sensory motor loops and sensory interactions. In the next video, we're going to see how we can use reward-based learning to change sensory motor interactions and drive goal-directed behavior. And that is essential as a starting point for understanding sensory perception.